In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, Leaf Tulin is going to give us his top 10 rookies as we head into the second half of the season. Stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sports book of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of... NBA Draft Junkies, and my co-host today, Leaf Tulin, the man that watches more college basketball than anybody else, but today we're going to talk about the NBA, but before we get started, has it started to get a little crazy in, in Salt Lake yet? Like, are the people starting to come in? Uh, I, I can confirm to you there's been a lot of stuff going on, because I, I work for the Jazz, for those of you that don't know, and uh, I, I was working a road game, so I was just in the arena working on some production audio sound stuff. And I couldn't get into the arena without a absolutely horribly strenuous process where they had to check that I was supposed to be working, even though I was like going to the game and the jazz were playing. I had to show my ID and clarify that I was on a, a list that was allowed to be there. And they were building things in like parking lots and everywhere around the arena and closing off gates that you typically enter into a normal jazz game just to make the all-star game special. And then I work at a radio station about three blocks away, and they had a whole new all-star convention across the street from that. So all of downtown Salt Lake City, which is a grid for those of you that don't know, is is dedicated to the all-star game right now. So it should be pretty cool. Um, I'll be around, and if anyone's there, let me know. And uh, yeah, the all-star game, you're going to see some of the rising stars that we're going to talk about in the moment there. And I, I think that there's a pretty clear-cut list for a couple of the top guys, and then it becomes a little fishy towards the middle. Yeah, I'll be there Saturday. I would come earlier, but my wife's birthday is on the 17th. She shares the same birthday as Michael Jordan. And for the married men out there, you're probably like feeling sorry for me in a sense because I got hit with Valentine's Day and my wife's birthday in the same week, which is going to be All-Star Weekend for the rest of my life, which, you know, usually... um I usually get 10 All-Star Weekends, but I'll be there on Saturday. Still haven't figured out where I'm staying yet. <laughs> so um, it looks like the hotels are pretty are pretty pricey. And I waited so late, I don't even have a credential to get in anything. So I'll keep my fingers crossed to see if um, you know I can pull some strings here to to be able to, to get access to things without paying. But I'm mostly going for basketball without borders. That's my main intent. I followed and tracked a lot of those. I don't want to call them kids, but a lot of the prospects last year when I was staying abroad. And so this would be a good opportunity to see a lot of those guys in in one building and see them in the NBA setting. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, So if anybody's going to Basketball Without Borders, hit me up. I will be there Saturday and Sunday. But let's talk about the guys that are in the NBA now, because I think a few of those guys will be in the NBA I'm talking about the guys from basketball all borders the last year I went was 2020 and Josh Giddy was there and it's crazy because Josh wasn't even the best player there like it was John Montero to me he was the best player um I don't I don't, I don't know if there's anybody else from that class off the top of my head that, that made it to the NBA um but it just shows you how you know what, what a difference a few years can make because I think Giddy's going to be an all-star one day. And again, he wasn't even in the, the best player there. So let's talk about this 2022 draft class, which is led by Paolo Bancaro, which I'm assuming he is number one. But let's go backwards. All right. Who are your top oh. 10 rookies? All right. Bancaro is number one. So no spoilers there. I would say my number 10, and towards the end, it gets a little little bit more difficult. I'll go with my number 10 is Jeremy Sohan as of performance this year. And, and uh, I think he can become better down the road, but he's starting to really pick up his, uh, his pace of play. He's really learned the NBA game. His free throw shooting draws a lot of attention because he switched techniques. But I think that speaks to the – it's a testament to his learning and, and ability to accept coaching. 
scoring about 10, uh, 10, 11 points a game, impacting the game on offense and defense. Shooting leaves something to be desired, but I really like the way he's been able to add stuff to his game each and every month almost. And so I think he he's the the 10th spot with a lot of room to improve. What's crazy is a year ago at this time, and maybe it was around maybe it was around this time, give or take a few weeks, he wasn't considered the best prospect on Baylor. Like a lot of people thought Kendall Brown was. I know at the very beginning of the year, I had Kendall Brown as high as like number six on my board. And he slowly started to decline throughout the the weeks. And then Jeremy was on the rise. And it's just a huge difference between like where they were drafted. And Sohan has played really, really well for San Antonio. So um, it, it would be interesting if I went back and looked at different draft boards around this time. I wish there was a way to like sort them out from, you know, every month of the year, see like where Jeremy was at in mid-February last year on different draft boards. All right. Who is number nine on your list? Um, number nine and 10 were very close for me. I, I, I'm going with Tari Eason. I think Eason and Sohan were pretty interchangeable and maybe Maybe as of very recently, I'd say Sohan's played better, but Eason had a little bit more of a consistent spell. Uh, Eason's a guy who impacts the game in all facets facets of the stat sheet. He's a guy who I really kind of fell in love with late in the draft process because he was so, he was so, I, I would say he was so determined to impact the game at LSU that sometimes it was almost negative for the the team's winning percentage but then you watch him play in the summer league and you fall in love with the way he plays so that was really fun and I would say that his NBA game the what he needs to improve is shooting but his activity is so immense that I think he deserves a spot on this list I think that he's being done absolutely wrong in Houston I get You know, Jabari Smith was the third pick, and he's their guy. But I just – I and I've said it since Summer League. In a fair and open situation where you needed to win games, if the Houston Rockets – let's just say if it was Europe and the Houston Rockets were facing being demoted to the G League, I think Tari Eason would play more minutes – than Jabari Smith. I think they needed to win. There are no politics involved. And this is just my opinion. Tari Eason would play more minutes because I think he is effective and he can impact games without, you know, being set up. I mean, he can come in. I think if he played, I and mean, he had a few games where he started, but I think if he were the starter and was playing 30 minutes a game, without a doubt, he would average a double-double. In my opinion. I, I, I agree. And number eight for me is Jabari. And, and let me rationalize this. Uh, I We had a discussion at one point, I think right after Summer League, and, and you knew, like we both were familiar with each other's boards and we were both relatively high on Sohan. I'm mean, sorry, not Sohan. Uh, Eason. Eason ended up in, in my top 12. And I, I said he was the most likely guy going to Summer League to really imp- improve his like post-draft stock where people are like, man, well, we missed on this guy just because I knew activity would translate. Um, the reason that I would say I have Jabari higher is because I think the situation is equally difficult for him is he's playing a lineup with guys that don't pass. He he's, he's playing as a guy who's playing, trying to play physically and not getting the ball and what he's done and just not complaining and going valiantly and trying to play basketball and, and defending as hard as he can. I've seen flashes defensively that have been really impressive. And I just know he can shoot the ball, even though he's not getting as many looks scripted for him as, as Silas told us today. But uh, I, I I applaud his professionalism and the fact that he's playing enough minutes to be, you know, show those flashes is encouraging. But I agree. If they were trying to win basketball games and every, all things were equal, I think they'd do a lot of things differently with their guards, quite frankly. But I also think that Tari Easton would be the better between the way they play for the team they're on. But see, here's why I disagree. Jabari Smith is shooting 31% on catch-and-shoot jumpers. He's shooting 31.8% on unguarded catch-and-shoot jumpers. Like, that is supposed to be his thing. He's supposed to be a knockdown shooter, and he is struggling. I mean, like, catch-and-shoot, that was supposed to be the easiest thing. So even though guys may not be getting him the ball, 
when he is getting open looks, he's just not he's just not making them. <laughs> and so I, I think that if you're supposed to be a specialist in a sense, and you're not, and he's still young, still plenty of time. And again, I'm biased towards Eason because I think Eason is he just that can impact the game in, in different ways without needing to be to be set up. But it it's funny because you're preaching to the choir. That was my whole pitch on Tari Eason. That's the reason I was lower on Jabari Smith than the consensus was because I didn't think he had quite as high a ceiling. Like he would always have to be a, a guy like Rashard Lewis to me. Um I will say this in his defense. I've always liked Jabari Smith in high school. I liked him in Auburn. The reason that I remain kind of bullish on him is because you watch him shoot the ball and it's really effortless. I think as a shooter, it's really hard to play when you don't know when you're going to get the ball and try to shoot effectively. It's just confidence wanes, and especially there's ups and downs, ebbs and flows of being a rookie. And so I think in terms of just pure effectiveness and, and ability early this year, Tari Eason may have a claim to eight over Jabari Smith, but I think Jabari Smith playing more minutes and, and kind of adapting to that um, – I think bodes better for him in the future in terms of his growth. Cause I think once he gets out of that system and he becomes more prominently featured, whether it's by addition, by subtraction with one of those guards going, uh, I think he's going to really take a step forward. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a nasty situation in Houston <laughs> just overall period. I mean, it's just, it's just bad. Another thing about Jabari, and I don't want to sit here and harp on him, but he's only shooting like, 38% as the pick and roll man, right? It's just struggles everywhere. I think at a better situation, you know, his numbers could be a little bit better, which um, I, I heard a coach say once about the Phoenix Suns a few years back. He made a comment about, and this is a comparison that people are going to think I'm crazy about, but he made a comment about Dragon Bender. And he said that Dragon Bender only knows how to play structured basketball. He doesn't know how to hoop. And when you're on a bad team, you better know how to hoop <laughs> because that ball is not coming back to you because you have a bunch of guys that are going to start playing for for their numbers. And Jabari knows how to play basketball. He's just not knocking down shots, but he's going to have to learn how to create his own offense because he's not going to get it. And that's the thing like with Shingun that I saw during Summer League like he, they were not passing the ball. I mean, he was on the team with Jalen Green, Josh Christopher. Um, I don't know if Kevin Porter, Joe, but it was the same thing. Marcus Foster. I mean, he was on a team with some guys that were known for putting it up, but he started doing things like getting the rebound and pushing it himself. And, um, you know, just kind of creating his own offense where he had to learn how to be a little bit selfish. And that's what he's been able to do this year, even though he's, he's passing the ball at, at, at a really good rate, but he's learned how to, how to, I guess, hoop and, and get his numbers in, in bad basketball. All right, who is number seven on your list? Yeah, and I, I feel like the, that's a tough system regardless. Uh, number seven for me is Keegan Murray. And Keegan Murray has fit the role to a T for a surprisingly good Sacramento team that people had hopes for, but a lot of those hopes were almost like a backhanded compliment, be like, oh, I think this is their best team since. And, you know, they were almost making uh, a joke out of the Kings franchise and how they would had the longest playoff drought. But I think quietly Keegan Murray's filled exactly the role that you anticipate for him. And yes, he'll grow in the future. But I think this is the reason some people were lower on him because this is like, you know, he's plug and play. Ceiling's not stupendously high, but he comes into the league and he shoots the ball well. He defends OK. I, I uh, as I've worked for the Jazz, I went to a press conference there. Mike Brown was talking about Keegan Murray. He said, hey, Keegan, how are you going to impact the game if you're not shooting well? And Keegan like was thinking about it, and he's a thoughtful guy. He's like, well, I, I rebound the ball. I defend. like you know." And that's exactly like the humility with which he approaches the game really impresses me, and, it's the, and it reflects in the way he plays basketball. So I think he's just like steadily a contributor for a team that's really improving. Yeah, I mean, he's on a team that's winning, and he's putting up – Good numbers, and you got to respect that. 41% from three, I think that's the numbers, the last numbers that I saw. Yeah, 41.5 which... and 12 points a game right now, so just steady production. Yeah, you can't I mean, you can't beat that. On a, on a team that's winning, I mean, who, who wouldn't take that? Right, when we return, we'll talk about a few other rookies in his top six, but let's talk about FanDuel because we are at the midway point of the NBA season. 
well, it's the midway point in the season in a sense, but as far as games played, I mean, we're, we're down to like 26, 27 games for some teams. But it is still plenty of time to download the FanDuel app, which is America's number one sports book, because if you're a new customer, you get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet does win. So just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe, it is secure, and it is easy to use. Then you can bet on anything you want, from the money line to the point scores and threes drank. So FanDuel, it's like I said, it's number one, and it even lets you combine the best, I'm sorry, even lets you combine the bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game part leg. So do not miss the chance to get your own no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That is fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. So make every moment more with FanDuel, which is the official sports betting partner of the NBA and Locked On. Now, once again, you are listening to the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. This is Rafael Barlow and Leaf Tuling. We have covered four of Leaf's top rookies. No, I'm sorry, three of his top rookies. So at number four, which we're going backwards, number six on his list, who is that player? Uh, I'm going to go with Jalen Duran, and I sincerely believe he will skyrocket up this. If we were doing a future betting how good they'd be, he'd be higher. Uh, I've had the benefit of watching him in person, and just the way he moves, catches the ball, is so, so impressive. So from a prospect standpoint, I'm very high on Duran. That said, his numbers have been relatively pedestrian as opposed to some of his competitors in this top. And so since we're purely going off of this season, I think his impact may be larger um, down the stretch of the season than it has been already. So that's encouraging. But he's he's had to deal with injuries to guys that would really help him thrive more, such as Cade Cunningham, who if I think if Cade Cunningham were, were playing this entire season, Jalen Duran may be higher on this list. That said, he's a rim protector. He rebounds like a beast, runs the floor. Uh, he, he finishes strong. I, I had Duran in my top six, and I'm pretty – happy about that because i think he's going to be an all-star down the road and i i've never seen someone look like dwight howard and he's close yeah he's close but there's a kid james naji who's in this draft from barcelona similar build where you're like how are you a teenager like like yeah like, what did never you look like person, when you were 14 did you, did you have these muscles at 14 but he's he's going to be really good he's shooting 65 percent from the floor but here's what is weird to me I don't understand the fit with him and James Wiseman. I think Wiseman's a five, and I think Jalen's a five. Do you think Wiseman is a four? No, I'm with you. I I think they're both fives, and from a developmental sense, I don't like that for Duran, who I think you just got to embrace as the better Memphis Tiger. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's it's crazy because, you know, I I caught a lot of flack uh, a few weeks back about saying the Pistons – don't need Scoot Henderson because they already have Cade and uh, Jaden Ivey. And I guess positional fit and roster balance doesn't matter. So they probably will take a point guard for the, what is it, three out of the last four years. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that really just stunts the development of somebody. So unless Wiseman is an asset that they were bringing in to – kind of rebuild his reputation and stock and they're going to package him and move him somewhere else. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't know if you can play both of those guys together, especially if you're Jaden Ivy, right? And your, your game is based on getting to the rim. If you have no floor spacing, <laughs> then, then I don't know how effective he'll, he'll be finishing at the rim. So still weird to me, but, I will say that that Wiseman had a, a decent game in his in his debut in Detroit. Right, who is number five? Number five for me is Jalen Williams, uh, the Santa Clara product as opposed to the Arkansas product, both on the Thunder. He was a guy that I was a little late to the party on, but as soon as Summer League started, I was like, man, this guy's better than even pick number 12, which I thought was higher than where I anticipated he'd go. He is a guy that played with the ball in, in Santa Clara 
And then he's adapted beautifully to being an off ball guard who, who embraces cutting, hitting open shots, defending. He's a perfect three and D and he's one of my favorite rookies in this class. Um, even if he's not as highly ranked as a few of the ones I'll have coming up, he may be my favorite watch. I, I think he's phenomenal. And I, I think Oklahoma city has got the best core of youth in the bat in, in basketball. And I'm very excited to see what he develops into. Yeah. Their, their core is pretty good. Um, I mean, they, I shouldn't say pretty good. Their core is really good. And the season has been pretty good for them as far as like wins and losses. Do you think they should go for it as far as like making the play in? Uh, I I do. I, I think they've got enough young pieces that are really good that they should try to develop early and, and see how they fare in a playing situation. And if they overachieve, that's awesome. If they underachieve, whatever. Uh, I think it's a, it's a no lose situation um, because at this point you're, you're about 500 and it's say, say you lose the majority of the games. I think the jazz are in the same boat. If, if they're able, if they're going to lose that many games, you're not going to get yourself within the top seven. So I don't think differing between 10 and 16 is, is that enormous. Yeah. I mean, either way, the Thunder are in a good situation because they have a, a good rookie this year in Williams. And then they have a top three pick next year, top two pick next year, which is going to be, Chet Holmgren. So they're they're in a really good situation. I, I had this conversation with a with a, a friend of mine a few weeks back, and he was talking about the draft. It's a little bit off subject, but he said that in 2018, and I know some people are gonna say, Oh, this is revisionist history. Everybody could say it now. But he said in 2018, he had Shay Gilgis Shy, is it Shay or Shy? I thought it was been Shay, but then I just saw someone say maybe it was on Instagram that it's shy, but I've heard Shay. So anyway, I'll just keep saying Shay. He had Shay Gilgis Alexander ahead of Trey Young. And he said that if he were a GM and he took Shay ahead of Trey, he said he probably would have got fired. He said he would have just hoped for longevity to where <laughs> uh Shay could you know, he would have had the opportunity to be right. And I and I just saw somebody make a comment today after the Hawks loss that maybe the Hawks should see if they could trade Trey Young for Gilgis Alexander and send Trey back to Oklahoma. And I was like, you know what? Maybe two years ago, it probably would have happened, but I don't think right now they would do an even swap unless both were like disgruntled or whatever. Well, what are your thoughts on that? It's a little off subject, but... Uh, I think I agree with you just due to the transition into in, in size being so prominent a factor in, in, in the NBA. I think the fact that Shea's bigger really helps him because Trey's an amazing offensive player, but it really struggles defensively. And their their window seems to have shut, at least through the short term, whereas OKC's is so predicated around Shea, but they also have so much youth around him that all seems to fit into – cohesive pieces we haven't seen them truly compete but I, it just seems like it will so i'm with you on that yeah and it's crazy it makes sense though like you said if if he had taken shay over trey and he probably would have got fired after a year especially after atlanta made it to to uh to the eastern conference finals which i think kind of ruined them in a sense i think they were they weren't ready it was the whole philly ben simmons thing the expectations in Atlanta increased. They started making win now moves, and then this this move for Murray just doesn't look like it has it has panned out. All right, who is number? Are we at number five? Uh, number four now. Number four. Okay, who's in your top four? I got, I got Walker a, Kessler. Okay, I was going to say, I, I have a hint that it's going to be your your hometown guy. It, it was um, a guy that I was too low on coming into the draft, but um. I have seen him plenty front and center. And I knew from maybe the third game of the season that he was the future at the center spot for the jazz. And it was so abundantly obvious, just the way he impacted the game coming in, being able to run the floor, defend and really alter a team's offense. Like it looked reminiscent of Gobert's development. And I know that's like a common cliche thought, but it really did. It's and, actually better. If you think about it, it's better because Gobert was playing for the Bakersfield Jam. His, his, 
his rookie uh, year. Uh, yes, no, they absolutely. I agree with you that that it it's a faster acceleration period. Yes. But it, in terms of when they started playing for the Jazz, um, he's also developing offensively in ways that you kind of saw flashes of at Carolina, but rarely at Auburn. He's not a great jump shooter, but you're seeing his hands are excellent. He's able to kind of up fake and go to the rim and pivot. But the factor that matters so much to me is is the fact that he is able to really apply coaching. And, and because I work for the Jazz, I see this often. Like I see these same plays and I see his improvement. He He's able to read off different players. I think the fact that Mike Conley is gone now really hurts him more than just about anyone because he's no longer getting pick and roll dunks and he's not – getting all these same touches and learning from a great veteran. So I think his stats may actually look worse as the, as the season progresses, but I think he'll grow infinitely from this experience of playing with, uh, with a team that's, shall I say, shorthanded. Um, but, but it, the, to me, the question of this draft is who's going to be better him or Jalen Duran at this point. Like uh, that's an interesting conversation. I think I may lean towards, towards Jalen, but if he's, going to be playing the four <laughs> with next to James Wiseman. I think that's going to to stunt his development. It's crazy because Conley is now helping out Rudy in Minnesota, and I was at the Mavs Jazz game, and you could see the you could see that they have chemistry, that they've played together, but you could also see that it is part of the Jazz. I'm not not the Jazz, but the the Timberwolves game plan to actually utilize Rudy and, and get him some touches and, and just use the gravity for him as a role man to create open looks for, for other guys. So it's going to be interesting to see how Minnesota plays once they get everybody back. But as far as like Walker, man, every time I say his name, I'm like, is it Walker Kessler or Kessler Walker? <laughs> as far as, as Walker Kessler, it's like you're starting to see some of the flashes you saw from him in high school. Like in high school, if you watch like his highlight tapes, which of course it's a highlight tape and it's only going to show highlights, but you saw a lot more skill than you saw at North Carolina and Auburn. And I learned a, a valuable lesson with him because at one point I had him high on my board, maybe like in the, in the twenties, then I took him off. And then I thought like, Oh, you know, maybe he can't defend in space and so on. I did the but same thing. It's like, you know what? Trust your gut. And that's why I'm high on, on, on Donovan Klingon from, from UConn because I think he could have a, a similar role. And it may be even the same trajectory in a sense because I think next year as a sophomore, if he does return to school, I think he can put up some <laughs> some uh, some some really good good numbers. All right. When we return, we'll finish out your your list of the top rookies. Stay tuned. All right, last segment, we are going to round out the top three rookies in the 2020 NBA draft. I'm so used to saying 2023 in the 2022 NBA draft. And, you know, it's like three names that are, are in the running. I think we know what number one is. Just curious to see if the gap between two and three is closing. So who is number three on your list? I think this might surprise people, but I I'm gonna go with three being Matherin and two being Ivy. Mm, okay. All right. Quick, and, before you get into that, do you think they would be better off if they switch teams? I've, I think I've asked you if this question K, if Cade Cunningham were healthy. Yes. I, that's how I feel. I feel like it'll be. I just feel like their roles or, or the fit is better if they swapped. If they swap teams. If Cade were healthy, I, I, I full heartedly agree. Um, I'll explain why I've got Ivy ahead of Matherin. Yes, and, you and, got to, because I'm sure there's going to be people in the comments calling you crazy and so on. Yeah, but yeah, no, and and box. this is not Matherin uh, hate. I, I it's rather it's it's Ivy love. I, I love watching Jay and Ivy play. He was a guy that I had on my board for the draft prior to this cycle, just because of flashes. Um, so Ivy's averaging 15, four and five, five assists, and he's playing without Cade Cunningham. And I think that factors in people may, may look at those raw numbers and the lack of efficiency and say, Oh man, like, why, why are you saying this? But I think he's learning on the fly. And I really value that. Whereas I think Matherin's greatly benefited by the fact that he has Tyrese Halliburton. 
Like he he has given great shots. He's also got a lot of help from a guy like Buddy Heald, who stretches the floor and gives him opportunity. Matherin came out sh- out of the can and shooting amazingly, and he's yeah. really yeah. impactful. He's scoring 17 a game off the bench, which is awesome. And I'm not taking away anything away from him. But if you look at who's shooting better from three, it's Jaden Ivey. If you look crazy. at who's <laughs> if you're looking at who's shooting better uh, from three, it's Ivy. Like I said, if you're looking at who's creating more, handling more responsibility, it's Ivy. Uh, Ivy to me is a better defender at this point. It, that's close, but I, I I would take Ivy defensively. And I think that part of this evaluation has to do with that, the fact that I think he is going to get better and better as the last 30 games of the season happen. Whereas I think Matherin's hit this peak where the rest of the season, if he stays at a steady level, that's a successful season. It's just hard to see him progress in the role that he's in, and the Pacers are starting to get worse, and Ivy's starting to get better for the Pistons. And and I just think that if Ivy can keep up the space, maybe even add a point or two to his, his uh, shooting ability. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, point scoring and then a percentage or two to his shooting, both free throws and threes. I think that's hard to argue that he's not the better prospect long term. And at the same point, with more responsibility, he's probably the better player currently. Yeah, Matherin's three point shooting has kind of fell off a cliff. He was scorching hot at the beginning of the season, which, you know, we, we figured that he wasn't going to be able to sustain. He's like shooting like 46% or something like that the first month or whatever. And now he's down to 31%, which I was kind of shocked to see that. Ivy is shooting a better percentage from three. I, I just kind of looked at the the raw numbers. I didn't look at the the volume and see if there's like a much difference in the volume. But you know, I don't think if you were a betting man and you would have had to bet on who would shoot the higher percentage from three, I don't think people want to bet on bet on Ivy. And so here's a question: Detroit has a number two pick in the draft. What do they do? Uh, I, I, I still think Scoot's the better prospect than Brandon Miller, but I, but I agree that that fit is just too loaded. I'd honestly try to trade. Like I would, I would try to see what value you can get from an established NBA player at a position of need and sell that really hot commodity of a two pick as my personal opinion. That said, Brandon Miller, you know, this, this is not hindsight. Uh, we talked about him in July and this is a guy I really love. I think he'd be an instant impact on that team. Yep. I just wonder if you could get, a pick in the seven or eight range and a really good NBA player already. Who's like, my gosh, we want scoot Henderson. We'll give you the farm. So this is no hate on Miller or scoot. I I just think scoots a slightly better prospect still. And that that's my, that's my take on what I would do. That said, I don't think I'd be mad if I took Brandon Miller. I just wish scoot played, man. Like he's played maybe 14 games this year. It's not a lot. Like I was at the Legends game against they got listed at 17 games. And I was at the Ignite Texas Legends game um this past weekend. And he didn't play, neither did City Sissoko. So it's kind of disappointing in a sense. And it just seems like he's missed, you know, a fairly significant amount of time this season with either a concussion or like a nasal fracture. And and so it's just been it's it's been crazy. But I mean, his stock was solidified. I don't, I don't think there was a chance that his stock was going to fall unless somebody had like a phenomenal year. But I think Brandon Miller is is the better fit. All right, last player, Ben Carroll, who came out the gates uh, hot, and he's still in first place. And he's averaging, at least the last numbers I looked, I don't know if they played tonight, around 20.6 rebounds, three and a half assists. The shooting splits aren't great, 41 and 28%, uh, 28% from three. But he is, I mean, is he going to be the first number one pick to win Rookie of the Year since Ben Simmons? I think so. And Simmons yeah. didn't even, I don't, and Simmons didn't even win his own year because he, he missed the year. Yeah. Donovan but, uh, won that year. <laughs> my, my guy Donovan right there. Um, oh gosh, I remember having so many arguments with people because I've never been a Ben Simmons guy. Never. For the record, I, I thought Simmons should have won Rookie of the Year. That said, I was on the Donovan Mitchell hype train when he was a freshman at Louisville. So that was my that was my first claim to fame as a fourteen year, a sixteen, fifteen year old <laughs> at that point, sixteen when he got drafted. So Bancaro, before before I get too far off track, 
You had him number one all year on your board. I had him I, number I one. Before, I didn't have him all year until the game against Gonzaga. So at the beginning of the season, I had Chet. So I want to say that was like November 26th. I don't know why I remember the exact date. But after that, it was Ben Carroll all the way through, and I never wavered on it. Uh, I have my my good friend Andrew. If you're listening to this, you you can reaffirm this. He is a diehard Duke fan. We just bought our March Madness tickets today, and I told him, and he was like, "I love," and he he's a center, so he loves Chet. And I told him, "I hate to say this because I don't like Duke, but Ben Caro's better than Chet." And that was when we were at March Madness last year. We were watching Texas Tech play Notre Dame, so March twentieth probably. And from <laughs> then on, I had I had uh, at Ben Caro number one, but. He comes into the NBA and he does exactly what he does at Duke with a bigger floor and he's playing with better athletes and against better athletes. And I, you, you could make an argument those first two months in the year of the year, he looked better than he did against college players. His first two months, like th- yeah, that's did. not the craziest uh, argument to make. Yeah, he, he definitely did. I mean, I, that's why I was so high on him because I figured he would, there were things that, he didn't really get a chance to show at Duke as far as like the passing. It was only flashes. And then he's just getting to the line at like a ridiculous rate in, in the NBA. He's kind of cooled off of, of late, which, you know, is expected. The rookie wall. But Orlando is good. I think Orlando should go for it. I think, I mean, it's it's going to be tough. But I think they, I, I think if they can get high to continue the, the pace they're going, they may have a chance to to get into that, uh, to that play-in spot. And I, I would go for it. I, I like what Orlando's brewing up there, honestly. I think their length, positional size, they just need to find a pass-first point guard. And um, I really like what they're set at. Yeah, I think you can probably find a, a, a backup good setup, man. Like I would I would go for one of the Jones guys, Jones brothers, Tyus or or, or Trey, Trey as like your, your backup guy that just kind of sets the table. Well, that wraps up this episode. Once again, thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. Now you have to check out the Locked On Game to Game NBA Podcast. Every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked On Game to Game covers the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. So follow the Locked On Game to Game NBA available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, Wherever you get your podcast, once again, it's Rafael Barlow, Leaf Tulane. We are out.